What is up, Bitcoiners? It's your boy CK, and this is another episode of the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. This one was especially special. That was a tongue twister. I sat down with Lord Futitua. He is one of the lords of Tonga, and he is just an incredible Bitcoiner. The man is a legend. He is on Twitter all day, on Twitter spaces all day with the plebs talking Bitcoin, and the man sees an opportunity to bring Bitcoin into the realm in Tonga. Bitcoin is already prevalent in Tonga, but Lord Fujitoa wants to make it legal tender. He has a four-part plan, and it is really amazing seeing how well he understands Bitcoin, how much he is a Bitcoiner, and how much he thinks that he can move Bitcoin into the legal framing in Tonga. He's already working with uh, the writers of the El Salvador bill and is working on making it work in Tonga. And again, this is an amazing example of how Bitcoin is going to be good for humanity and how Bitcoiners are everywhere. So uh, this is an incredible conversation with Lord Futitua. Uh, it was a quick one. I had a hard stop, but it's absolutely dense. I think I may ask Lord like four or five questions and he just went at it. So uh, you guys are really going to like this one. Let's get right into it. Welcome to Bitcoin Magazine Podcast. Thank you, brother. It's, uh, it's a privilege to be here. Um, I know uh, how uh, revered this publication is in our community, so it's a, it's a big honor to be here. I appreciate wow. the, the invitation. Well, that's an honor to, to come from you. Uh, I've discovered you just on Bitcoin Twitter and... <laughs> You know, for someone who is uh, kind of involved in government like yourself, uh, you, you know, they, they a, a man like you is typically not in Twitter spaces um, with just 50 people chopping it up um, about Bitcoin. Yeah, so, yeah. so uh, they told me. I, I don't know why. There should be more of us there because, yeah, that's kind of our job <laughs> to ensure we're representing the people and their interests. So, yeah, it's... It's a community that I'm yeah, I'm very uh, thankful to be part of. Yeah, so I mean, I guess, Lord, let's just jump into uh, to your story. Uh, you know, yeah. who who are you, and and how did yeah. you how did you end up uh, in Bitcoin? In Bitcoin, yeah. Uh, so I'm a, a member of Parliament, a Lord member of Parliament in the Kingdom of Tonga, a small island in the South Pacific. Uh, we, when we Christianized and modernized, we adopted a system similar to the, uh, the United Kingdom. So with a house of Lords and a house of commons, uh, but we have it just in one unicameral house, uh, all together. Uh, so there's nine of us Lords, uh, 17 people's reps, and we're called, uh, the Legislative Assembly of Tonga. So we're similar to your your Congress and, and Senate if it was put together in one house. Uh, so I represent uh, my constituency, which is uh, my estate under the uh, uh, our constitution when we uh, codified into a Western uh, legal system our, uh, our ancient chiefly uh, lines and titles uh, were codified into law so there are 33 houses of the nobility under our constitution, uh, each with a title uh, and estates, uh, and uh, they are handed down by primogeniture, which is just means father to son, father to son. So um, the title I have, I'm the 20th Lord for Stuart. Uh, my title goes back 1,300 years. Uh, there are 19 uh, warriors that have held this title before me. Uh, and the land uh, over which we uh, which we own, but it's a Polynesian ownership model. So it's not like the British lords who are lord tenants and make people pay them uh, leases. Uh, a Polynesian uh, uh, chief is more a custodian of the land and the people. You look out for their welfare, make sure that they have uh, healthcare, education. Uh, core services, um, and, uh, yeah, try and look out for their development. So transitioning from uh, a traditional uh, leadership role to a political one is uh, uh, not too hard because that's basically a job. As uh, a person in governance, 
is to guarantee uh, your citizens uh, the core basic human rights that uh, our constitution is similar to uh, the US. The, the uh, first section of our constitution says, since it seems to be God's will uh, that men should be free and have the fruits of their labour, I therefore uh, put forward these laws. So our whole constitution is based on uh, life, liberty and uh, the freedom to pursue um, a way to make a living for yourself. Uh, so that's what I do. Uh, my main field in our domestic legislation was as the head of the anti-corruption uh, committee, just like your finance committee in, in Congress, et cetera, et cetera. My field's anti-corruption. Uh, and by virtue of that, uh, I was recruited by a number of international uh, parliamentary organisations, uh, GOPAC being the main one, uh, the Global Organisation of Parliamentarians Against Corruption, uh, which works with the UNODC, uh, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, to stamp out uh, corruption in, in uh, governments. Uh, but we also uh, follow uh, transnational crime. So the reason you get KYC AML at an exchange is so that we have the information to follow where money's coming from and going uh, together with NATO. We track those illicit financial flows around the globe to see how people like ISIS get uh, funded and make sure we stamp it out. Um, uh, also, I was recruited by the British Commonwealth as part of their human rights uh, division. I'm, I'm the chairman of uh, the Commonwealth's uh, Pacific uh, Human Rights uh, Parliamentary Group and we do things uh, about gender equality, uh, uh, persecution of people on religious grounds, uh, ethnic grounds uh, throughout the world uh, and in climate change. So uh, we do uh, climate change work, uh, which is funny. Uh, the reason we get, or I was, uh, recruited is because uh, the South Pacific is the largest hit by uh, climate change. Uh, we have sea level rising that's going to cause a number of our countries uh, to go underwater by 2035. Uh, and it's funny to me seeing armchair environmentalist people when uh, saying that Bitcoin mining is going to boil the oceans when people like us whose oceans are the ones that are going to be boiled uh, have done the, the research and have the data and the science that says that's simply not true. Uh, Bitcoin mining at worst is carbon neutral because it uses up uh, wasted energy and at best it's carbon negative because uh, it uses efficiently uh, off off peak and uh, load time changes to basically use up carbon that would otherwise be emitted. And uh, so, yeah, that's the general international work I do. Um, about 2013, um, a cousin of mine from the States rang up and said, uh, we were both into uh, computers. We taught each other to code in BASIC back in 1981 uh, when uh, the Commodore 64 and the ZX Spectrum by Sinclair Computers. You'll have to Google it to find out what it is. It was a computer with 16K RAM. Uh, we taught ourselves to code in BASIC and we are sort of uh, coding guys and uh, we, yeah, so we're into that kind of thing and uh, he said in 2013, rang me from the States and said, oh, there's this uh, new technology that uh, is basically um, the, yeah, it's a, it's a new monetary system which does everything that we've always dreamed about. And he said, you, you're not able to buy any from time, but I'll buy some for us. And when I see you next, I'll, I'll show you how I can give it to you. And so he did that. And eventually he came to Tonga and uh, we got together. He's like a brother to me. Uh, he's my cousin, but he's like a brother to me. We grew up together. And I finally said, oh, where's the, uh, where's the, the stuff? Where's the Bitcoin? And he said, oh, well, 
it kind of went up in price a little bit, so I kind of sold it. So, yeah, we'll, we'll figure out how to get you some more. So, yeah, that went by the wayside. And then about two or three years later, um, I was already in Parliament and we had, um, in the developing world, it's anyone who's from the developing world will know this, we have a phenomenon of uh, uh, American businessmen, usually from places like Florida, uh, who wear Miami Vice white suits and come through with a great idea that's going to make millions for all of us. And we invest in it. Uh, and they kind of disappear with that, or the, everyone's money. Uh, but uh, he again said Bitcoin. So not just myself, a couple of the other lords, we invested with him, and he was going to buy us some. Um, and uh, eventually, uh, he did custody it for us. Uh, we didn't know all that much about the technology at the time, and he said he would uh, relay it to us uh, when he came back. And yeah, as they do, uh, these these kinds of fellows, uh, uh, yeah, nothing against them. That's just a phenomenon. Uh, he disappeared with everyone's money, and uh, we never saw him again. <laughs> so that was about 2016, and then two, a little over two years ago, uh, I got really sick in Tonga. I'd just been on a national uh, consultation tour, taking uh, some new constitutional amendments that were made in our country and uh, being the only qualified lawyer in Parliament, I had to travel around the country and explain the, the law to the public uh, so that they could have a sort of referendum. They could make an informed choice on whether they wanted them or not. Uh, they ended up not wanting, to, wanting them and that was the reason I did the consultation because uh, the government who was in at the time, they've since been uh, ousted. Uh, wanted to change our constitution, take all the power from the judiciary and the legislature and give it to themselves and the executive. So thankfully, uh, once I'd explained the law to the country or the bills, uh, they threw them out. But it was a pretty hectic national tour. I had to go through every village in the country. And I got back and I collapsed. And um, in hospital in Tonga, they didn't have either the, uh, neither the resources nor the uh, staff to do the surgery. So I died clinically and they revived me and tried to keep me alive for 36 hours while they found an air ambulance. from. So they rang Sydney in Australia. They couldn't find one. These are the closest places, to, metropolitan places to Tonga. They rang Auckland in New Zealand, couldn't get one. And they found one in Brisbane in Australia and that air ambulance flew into Tonga. They were able to keep me alive for 36 hours in time to get the plane there and medivac me here to New Zealand uh, for surgery which began practically on the, uh, on the tarmac. Uh, so they got me in. Um, I died another two times <laughs> clinically and they revived me and gave me life-saving surgery, uh, three surgeries over a uh, a period of two days that ended up saving my life. Uh, but so I collapsed in July in Tonga and I woke up in September in New Zealand and it was like, what happened to the past two months? Uh, so I was then in recovery in hospital for six months. Uh, so there's not all that much to do in hospital. So... I proceeded to read every word that had ever been printed about Bitcoin, every word that had ever been recorded, spoken about Bitcoin, and every moving image that had ever been broadcast about Bitcoin. And, uh, yeah, six months, 24 hours a day, all Bitcoin all day, uh, and got uh, what I, I hope is a decent grasp of the technology. And I understood that, uh, in the developed world, in the metrop metropolitan world, this was a, uh, a new monetary system, the most pristine asset that mankind's ever produced, a sound money that would uh, sever uh, the servitude to the hegemony of the fiat central banks and provide an asset where people uh, could uh, plan for possible 
uh, generational wealth because that was the extent to which the asset uh, appreciated over the past 12 years, uh, 10 years at the time, because this was in 2019. Uh, so 2019 didn't have, we hadn't hit the, the lows of 2020 and 2021 yet. So the annual uh, appreciation rate was well above 200%, uh, better than any stock, any kind of asset that ever happened before for the developed world. But it struck me that for the developing world, this would be life-changing now, right now. Uh, countries in the developing world uh, lose $700 billion annually uh, to uh, the remittance um, industry. So countries in the developing world get a lot of money sent back by their diaspora uh, who live overseas. Uh, China, uh, Mexico, Philippines, all these seemingly prosperous countries uh, are in the double-digit billions of the amount of money they get sent back from overseas. And in the developing world, it's even more so. In South America, uh, Central and Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the Caribbean and uh, the South Pacific, we practically, well, not practically, we survive off remittances. My country, Tonga, is second highest on the planet, 40.7%. Nearly half of our GDP is remittances. So without remittances, our, our, our economies collapse. Now, the problem with remittances is uh, the companies that do it, Western Union, MoneyGram, and the digital fiat uh, telephony organisations take at least, well, on average, for us, it's about a 30% cut. If you listen to uh, Jack Maller's uh, interview with uh, Peter McCormack last week, El Salvador's over a 50% cut. Uh, so our 40.7% of our GDP, we're actually only receiving about 21% because Western Union takes the other. Uh, so for places like that, exposure to Bitcoin the network can change our lives right now. Just Bitcoin the network. Bitcoin the asset, put Bitcoin the asset aside for a second. Just exposure to Bitcoin the network where Strike uh, will give me where previously when $100 was sent from our cousin in Los Angeles, we'd receive 70 because Western Union would take 30. Now we'll receive $100. And we don't have to travel by five hours from the village to Western Union either way, both ways. Cost ten dollars both ways. That's another twenty dollars gone. In El Salvador, there are gangs of uh, criminal gangs outside the Western Union, so it'll tax you another twenty percent. So of that hundred in El Salvador, you'll get back with maybe forty. Now, uh, for us, seventy. Now that has gone boom to a hundred, just by adoption of uh, the Lightning Network and Strike. So. No need without an act of parliament to for adoption, without having to convince your central bank, just installing one extra app on everyone's phone and one extra app at the point of sale uh, at cash points, similar to the ones Jack Mallis has rolled out in uh, El Salvador in Central America, and you're going to get $100. So the funny thing is, as soon as you get that $100, of course, you're going to spend the extra 30 to raise the standard of living. If you're a fisherman in a village uh, whose grandfather was a fisherman and grandfather was a fisherman, that $70 helps, but it's hand to mouth. So you're going to spend the extra $30 to uh, increase your standard of living. Maybe you can afford to send your kid to, uh, uh, to school with uh, breakfast now instead of on an empty stomach. Uh, maybe you can afford extra equipment to fish more. Uh, but after a while, you'll remember that you got by on $70 and you'll be able to live on $70. And when you do that, you'll save that extra 30 and you might save it in fiat, but because through Strike you can choose uh, in fiat or Bitcoin to a warm wallet, you might end up stacking sats. So for someone who is hand-to-mouth as a fisherman, suddenly be able to stack Bitcoin 
and have a shot at generational wealth, something he can hand down to his kids, that's life-changing. That's paradigm-changing. And uh, funnily enough, uh, the pristine nature of Bitcoin shows you that in the West, we begin a uh, store of value and then maybe we're beginning to move towards medium of exchange with uh, Bitcoin ATMs. In the developing world, they begin with medium of exchange, transacting in Bitcoin, and then we'll move to store of value as they're able to save. So Bitcoin, even if you do it back to front, still works perfectly. That's how pristine the asset is. Uh, and it's life changing either way you flip it. So, yeah, that's how I got into Bitcoin, bro. All right, let's take a quick break from that episode. I want to tell you guys about our sponsor. It is Bitcoin 2022 conference. I am sure you saw the videos. You may have been there in person. Bitcoin 2021 was an absolute smashing success. It was the biggest conference in Bitcoin history, crypto history, whatever history of the digital asset sphere. Bitcoin is number one, and the Bitcoin 2021 conference is number one with a bullet. It was an absolutely incredible time. I was working my ass off the whole time, but I got to meet so many incredible community members. And I think the best testament to how amazing Bitcoin 2021 was, was not just all of the amazing you know, accolades and, uh, and compliments that I got personally and our team got, but also it's the skin in the game in Bitcoin 2022. We have already sold close to 1,500 tickets. That is more than 10% of the people, everyone who went to Bitcoin 2021 have already purchased tickets to Bitcoin 2022. We have not released a date. We have not released a city. We have not released anything. That is the biggest compliment. That is the biggest skin in the game of the community being down for this conference. Bitcoin 2022 is going to be bigger than Bitcoin 2021. It's going to be better than Bitcoin 21 in every single way. And we are going to be bringing you the best opportunity to mingle with the biggest, the baddest, the most Bitcoin people on the planet. So join the revolution. Go to b.tc forward slash conference. Get your tickets today. I don't know what the ticket prices are. They are going up. I think they're $249 right now. We just rolled out fiat ticket uh, purchases. All the tickets purchased before today. We're all purchased in BTC. So get it, guys. Get it. Get this ticket. Be at Bitcoin 2022. See you there. Bitcoiners, I want to tell you guys about the Deep Dive. The Deep Dive is a new premium newsletter from the Bitcoin Magazine team in conjunction with my man, BTCization, Dylan LeClaire. Dylan is such a multifaceted and wide-ranging analyst. He does everything from on-chain analytics to macro uh, analysis to uh, you know, hash rate and all that kind of good stuff. He does it all. He breaks down everything that's happening every single day with his daily dive. He's going to dive into what is happening in the market that day. So that way you don't have to pay attention to Twitter. You don't have to pay attention to anything else. You can just pay attention to the deep dive and he has you covered. And at the end of the week, guess what? You get a weekly recap. And at the end of the month, hey, we have a freaking report, a beautiful PDF breaking down all the activity of that entire month, what it means for Bitcoin, what you can expect moving forward. The Bitcoin market is going to moon. We are here to make sure that we maximize your stack. Go to members.bitcoinmagazine.com to sign up today. And if you use promo code BITS, you can get one month for free. So again, the deep dive, I've been checking it out every day and you should too. Back to the show. Wow. Wow. A lot to unpack there, um, but I I love your perspective. I love the story. I love the context, um, and it's really interesting to hear how like how important remittances are to Tonga. How important remittances are to so many countries. I think so that's like a, I mean, I think that right there is the fact that they're so important. Just shows like that's a side effect of the fiat system in and of itself. That it sends exactly. people out of their yeah. countries and forces them to like send money back and get scraped on top of it right so like bitcoin yeah. first fixes the remittance problem but hopefully in the long term it fixes the the problem which is like there's no opportunity where you live there's no opportunity to invest there's no opportunity to build wealth, wealth which is what yeah. you kind of talked about is like the end game right that's the life-changing opportunity exactly exactly man. um 
being able to change your standard of living immediately and with a view to eventually being able to put away savings and have generational wealth for your descendants. That wasn't even, that's not even a dream in the developing world. No one ever believes they'll be able to put away money for their descendants. You're barely able to go hand to mouth now. So to give them both an extra hand to mouth and to build savings and wealth, man, that's, that's life changing. That shows you, like I said, Bitcoin, you flip it back to front, it still works better than anything in history. Uh, it's, yeah. It's the beauty of the asset. Yeah, I mean, and it's incredible hearing someone like yourself who, you know, has the platform in your country and internationally like yourself, you know, have this kind of knowledge and conviction around Bitcoin. Yes, well, um, I, I can't understand why anyone else wouldn't. And if they, if they aren't in the face of so much information, then that's a conscious choice not to. And that's a conscious choice, which is usually accompanied by some sort of connection to the central banking fiat system and those vested interests. Because anyone who's objective, like Senator uh, Cynthia Loomis uh, of uh, Wyoming, uh, who was interviewed on, I think, CNN or maybe MSNBC, or maybe Fox News, I'm not sure. One of them. Uh, yeah, one of them. Uh, but she, the, the interviewer trying to, to entrap her, said, um, oh, Bitcoin's down to 29. What are you going to do? You must be uh, pulling your hair out with this volatility. And she said, no, I'm actually stoked. I'm buying the dip like everyone should be uh, on national television. And she also, uh, thankfully, for once, we've got a, an American legislator uh, stating it clearly. Uh, she made it clear that Bitcoin renewables in the United States, Bitcoin uses 40% renewable energy. The national grid only uses 12%. So Bitcoin is four times more efficient than the American national grid at using renewable energy. So... That ball the ocean to fud, like I said, from someone who has skin in the game, whose country is possibly uh, going underwater a little bit at a time, uh, we've seen the data and the, the data doesn't lie. Uh, it's not Bitcoin's responsibility. It is exactly the opposite. It's the central banking fiat system whose industrialization has all caused this. I have to agree with you here. I think Bitcoiners need to turn this conversation on its head and say, on its head. Exactly. look, your grid, your fiat system, your misallocation of capital is destroying the planet. Get out of the way while Bitcoin fixes this. While well, Bitcoin fixes it, exactly. Not only are we not the problem, we are the solution. So we reject the premise of their argument outright and show them uh, the way to save the planet is going to be us. I mean, I think it's a beautiful thing. I could talk with you for hours on it. Maybe we're going to have to have a follow-up call to do so, but I want to hear about... Like I said, I'm hoping this is the first of many, brother. All right, incredible. (laughs) Well, I want to hear about, you know, a little bit about what's happening in Tonga. You said 40% remittances. Um, It sounds like, you know, you are aware of Strike. What's like the awareness of Bitcoin like in Tonga? Um, just what's what's happening on the streets? Uh, it's it's pretty good actually. Uh, what uh, even before um, the rollout that happened uh, around the 9th of June when the news struck? Uh, if anyone checks my tweets and recordings of our spaces, uh, I've been advocating that we've been using warm wallets prior to that. So even layer one Bitcoin is four times cheaper than Western Union, even layer one. And everyone goes, oh, layer one, it's too slow, it costs too much. Well, no, not to us in the developing world. It is still uh, a 4x in decrease in cost for us. So there was already, sorry, there was already a, a phenomenon uh, on the streets. Uh, our um, our retail sector is 99 percent 
uh, dominated by uh, ethnic Chinese. Uh, when Hong Kong went back to China in 1997, a lot of Hong Kong people fled uh, Hong Kong with their money to try and get away before China locked the place down. And a lot of them came to Tonga. So 5% of our population are ethnic Chinese who fled China. Uh, and they make up 99% of our retail sector. Now, because they're used to uh, uh, transacting in digital fiat in Hong Kong, it wasn't a great transition, for, a great leap for them to uh, transact in digital sats. So we've been sending money back to warm wallets where they've been able to use either cash out in fiat at these Chinese stores or uh, purchase goods directly uh, using their sats. And, uh, yeah, even prior to uh, Jack's rollout. And then when the, um, the El Salvador rollout hit, it became more obvious that uh, Bitcoin, the network, and lightning uh, makes it even easier and even cheaper because the average transaction is 0. 0.0000. You, you run out of, I, I lose count of the zeros, uh, 0. 0.0002 sats. So you're effectively, it's effectively free. So you send $100, you get $100. Uh, and Jack Mellers uh, kindly uh, offered once uh, my intentions became public. Uh, I kindly reached out and offered uh, carte blanche, whatever you need, uh, tell us, we'll help you. So uh, that what was are your intentions extremely anyway? generous of them. Not to interrupt, but your pardon? What, what are your intentions? What? Uh, so this is the plan. Know? Yeah, so the plan is a three-step rollout that I, I had envisioned was without any act of parliament, without any changes in the Reserve Bank, uh, just public education and rollout of the strike app, uh, just telling people, on that Chinese Android phone that you have, install the app, strike the app. Uh, mobile telephony companies in the developing world, they give out free handsets because they're looking for 100% penetration in the market because they make their money off credit top-ups, but more so off an application layer they install where people can log on to a website overseas, enter their credit card or banking details, and send digital, digital fiat straight to a handset in the islands, and they can transact in that. So ironically, uh, they... Uh, have given out these hand these handsets to the whole country and they've gone to the vendors and installed points of sale that can uh, transact with these this digital fiat so they've ironically rolled out the infrastructure that we can use for strike because we go and add strike to all of those uh, free handsets and then go and install uh, strike uh, the uh, BTC pay server or whatever uh, you want to use on uh, the iPad or the Android tablet at the point of sale. And we've got the whole country on, on Lightning and on SATs. So that's the first step is to get everyone installed with Strike, reach out to the, the vendors and get them to install uh, Strike or BTC pay server and immediately we are on the rails of the Lightning Network, of the uh, Bitcoin Network, and we're earning an extra 30% uh, into everyone's pockets automatically. It doubles, it nearly doubles our GDP overnight, and that's without any governmental uh, uh, inclusion or interference whatsoever. Uh, the next step is uh, doing what El Salvador did. Uh, very generously, the El Salvador team uh, got me a copy of the bill, of their bill, early. So I've been able to go over their bill. Usually when you introduce new legislation uh, into a country, in Tonga, it has to go to the Attorney General's office and then they'll go over it for about three months to check whether the new bill uh, 
is in contradiction with the Constitution or the other laws. Uh, because I'm in hospital, uh, I've done half of it in a week and I'll finish the other half by the end of this week. Uh, so that it's called a gap analysis. I've checked the bill and I've amended it to it for it to smoothly uh, align with our legislation and fit in. Uh, then the next thing you do is uh, you present it to Parliament and it goes through the clerk's office to the Lord Speaker. And then, as in the US, it goes through a number of committees. Uh, they'll vet the, the bill and then eventually table it in Parliament uh, for readings. It has three readings. And after that, uh, you get a ballot uh, and you pass it. And then it has to be signed by, by uh, His Majesty into law. So all the drafting work I can do from here in New Zealand, uh, the actual presentation of the bill and debating the bill, I have to be in time to do that. So uh, I'm just waiting for our, our borders to open. Unfortunately, we had planned to open the borders in September and then Fiji and Papua New Guinea, two countries right next to us, uh, began recording uh, 100 new COVID cases per day and they've had a, a massive uh, COVID uh, outbreak. So our Prime Minister, uh, understandably, uh, doesn't want to be the one on watch when you let COVID into the country. So he's locked our borders until March next year. So uh, officially, I can't get into Tonga until March next year. However, the only flights that are being let in are uh, Tongan, there are large groups of islanders, Tongans, uh, Fijians, Vanuatu, who are flown to Australia and New Zealand to pick their fruit. Uh, it's usually done by backpackers. Uh, that's historically what's happened, but because of COVID, there's no backpackers. So they struck a deal with our governments to fly our unemployed over, pick their fruit, uh, and then get cycled back every three months. So when those fruit pickers are fr is flown back on a special repatriation flight, every three, three months. That's the only way anyone's been able to get into the country is they hop one of those flights and you get you have to, every single person trying to get into Tonga has to get clearance from the Minister of Health herself. She clears everyone individually. So I have to get that clearance, get into the country, uh, present the bill and get it passed. Uh, in a house of 26, uh, 14 is a majority. So of 26, nine are Lord members. The Lord members always vote in a block. We vote together. Where one goes, we all go. No one ever breaks ranks. So my guys trust my judgment and they'll vote uh, nine with me. So that's nine. Uh, to make 14, you need five more. Uh, three of the people's reps, uh, as my understanding, they've reached uh, appreciation of the assets through their own individual journeys. So they're already orange pilled. Uh, that's 12, that leaves two. So I've got to get two votes from 14 people. And in a country of 100,000 where the average wage is $70 a week, once I get up in Parliament and say, I'm going to put $30 a week extra into your pockets, um, which one of you guys are going to tell the country that they can't have that $30? Uh, yeah, not many politicians are going to take that bet because they're out of a job at the next election if they do. So getting two votes out of 14 uh, shouldn't be too hard. Um, to get it into law, we don't have a president, we have a king, so he needs to sign it into law uh, and briefing his majesty. Uh, yeah, you don't do that over a Zoom call. Uh, that has to be done in person. Uh, he's an uh, ex-naval officer. Uh, he holds two naval degrees in, and two international law and policy degrees. and uh, he was the Prime Minister of our country when the IMF and the World Bank gutted our economy uh, with the austerity measures they force on you when you take a loan. And he was the Prime Minister that presided over the first ever and first and last riots in our country in 2005 by public servants rioting because their wages were cut. Why were their wages cut? Because the World Bank and the IMF forced us to because that's what happens when you take a loan. So he has no great love for the World Bank or the IMF, 
and a monetary system that can bypass them without being uh, uh, presumptuous enough to speak for His Majesty, I would hazard a guess that, yes, he, he would be uh, happy to see something that uh, circumvented those two, those two organisations. So, yeah, that's kind of the, the layout. And then, uh, obviously, uh, as with most developing countries, we measure our, our economic development largely by our uh, foreign currency reserves. So uh, that sort of shows how much you've been able to export. So we have 700 million in foreign currency reserves, USD, uh, sitting there. And it's basically the situation which Michael Saylor was faced with, which was, do I keep it in USD, melting at 5% per annum? Do I invest in bonds at a negative yielding at negative 2% per annum? Do I buy gold, which is inflating at 2.2 to 4% per annum? Or do I invest in this asset that appreciates at 200% per annum year, year on year for the past decade? Uh, as a completely, you know, they have to be for or against Bitcoin, completely dispassionately and unemotionally, objectively, that's the most sensible decision. Before we get back to the episode, I want to tell you guys about Bitcoin Magazine. Bitcoin Magazine is the oldest publication covering Bitcoin, and we've been covering Bitcoin since 2012. Y'all, I'm so proud to be working for Bitcoin Magazine. We spend all day trying to scour the internet for the top news, the top plebs, the top subjects, conversations, everything that has to do with BTC, the asset, BTC, the culture, BTC, the revolution. We are here for it. We are here for BTC and BTC only. And we want to give back to the Bitcoin community. Hit us up if you want to contribute. And uh, yeah, go follow us on Twitter. Go uh, subscribe to this podcast. Go follow us on YouTube. All of the places that you can find Bitcoin Magazine, we are there. Instagram, Reddit, everywhere. We're there. We're there. Follow us for the best Bitcoin knowledge. Back to the episode. Uh, our Reserve Bank should, in my belief, get at least 30% uh, in uh, Bitcoin. Uh, it's It will be uh, regarded by the US dollar as an attack on the US dollar because effectively, de facto, it is because we're saying we would rather hold the Bitcoin than the US dollar. So that one will involve some, some negotiation. Our governor of our reserve bank, is a traditional Keynesian econ economist. He's a good friend of mine. I have sat over many a long night uh, finishing a bottle of uh, Macallan 25 single malt with him, discussing the future of our economy. So he will see the sense of the idea. H him having the will to implement it is, uh, is another uh, question. But if uh, it's already legal tender, then he's fighting a losing battle. Um, so that's the third prong. And I had only intended three-pointed three, uh, three pointed, uh, adoption and uh, uh, expansion plan. But when this became public, uh, I was very generously uh, approached by uh, geothermal uh, energy and wave-harnessing energy companies uh, offering their technology uh, for Bitcoin mining. So my estate, not the whole country, excuse me, the actual island that is my estate is the only populated volcano uh, in the country. So it's a dormant volcano, and I had thought dormant volcanoes, you can't get geothermal energy from them. But these uh, very generous gentlemen and ladies from these companies have told me that they can extract geothermal energy. Uh, so they've offered their technology free of charge because they want to see a little Bitcoin country get it, uh, yeah, work and get ahead. Uh, some of the other companies are newer and they're offering their technology free because it's a pilot program for them that will advertise on a nation state level to other buyers um, that their technology works. So it's geothermal and wave generating energy, uh, wave harnessing energy. The wave harnessing is very simple. Um, it's, it's one of my more recent tweets. 
It's uh, a buoy with a magnetic coil in it. You break the waves, cause uh, uh, movement, kinetic energy, and break the magnetic field uh, that surrounds that uh, coil, and that produces an alternating current, which can get, which is then amplified and sent by cables to shore. Uh, and that's one thing we have no shortage of. Uh, being a Pacific Island nation, we're 153 small islands, uh, 68 of which uh, inhabited, uh, surrounded by 700,000 square kilometres of water that's moving all the time. <laughs> so that is our, our, our uh, most uh, replenishable resource is waves and this technology harnesses it and uh, mines Bitcoin out of it. So it's now a four-pronged plan and that's kind of the, uh, the, yeah, the plan behind the rollout. Wow. Well, I mean, I know that no good plan meets reality and lives, but the plan itself sounds absolutely fantastic. Um, I mean, in terms of having Bitcoin rolled out in Tonga, I, it's absolutely incredible to, th to think that, you know, there is such a viable path to it and that it's already being adopted by the people permissionlessly, uh, which is Bitcoin's greatest advantage in my sure. perspective. Um yeah. Lord, I, I need, I'm going to need to have you back on. Maybe next week I'll DM you. I do have a hard stop and I have to go. And I know. No we, worries, uh, brother. I'll be here next week. Anytime you tell me, I'm all good. I'm just sitting in hospital uh, on Bitcoin, Twitter, and Spaces all day, basically. <laughs> well, hey, I mean, that's that, that you're getting the information, you're having the conversations, and then you're translating that into information and opportunity, and opportunity for your people. And we started right, these conversations right, like, that's actually what most politicians should be doing, right? Like, what the heck are they doing? I would, I would hope that's what you'd think. We're called public servants for a reason because we're supposed to be serving the public. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. You're right. More of my colleagues should be doing this. Well, Lord, thank you so much for coming on. Sorry for the for the abrupt ending, but th I think no the worries. perfect time as well. So, you, this is a very exactly. dense, jam packed yes, episode. It. So, um, but I'm excited to share it. Uh, we want to give you an opportunity to give a last word, tell people where they can find you, wrap this one up for us. Yep, I'm just Lord Fusitua on everything. Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, SoundCloud, Spotify, everything. It's just Lord Fusitua. Um, you can see uh, the journey that we've had uh, politically in, um, uh, in other uh, areas and uh, You'll now see this one. There's a Bitcoin documentary maker who's going to document El Salvador on the ground. And he's asked to follow my journey from now until adoption. So you'll get a real time uh, account uh, as we work our way through. So that's an exciting project. But yeah, there's not really much about me. I'm just uh, a conduit and a messenger to try and get uh, Bitcoin out there uh, for our people. And for the world, it's uh, it's a world changing technology, and I appreciate it. It's an absolute honor and privilege to be here, brother. Uh, thank you for having me on. Amazing. Well, again, uh, appreciate the time. We'll be bringing more Lord back to the show, guys. Uh, but until then, you guys can all follow me at seek underscore snarks. You can follow the show at Bitcoin Magazine. Make sure to check us out. Give us those five star reviews. Share us with your friends and family, and uh, maybe your congressional members uh share this episode with them get them up to snuff they need to start watching out for uh their constituents uh but until then keep stacking sats thanks again appreciate you brother take it easy we'll talk soon